Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Hendrik, that's my colleague Brian. Uh, we are talking today about yeah, voice over LTE. I don't know if you're aware what that is, I hope so. Somebody heard of it? Of it? Somebody using it, maybe? Uh, maybe you are, but you don't know. Um, first of all, let's start with an introduction of who we are, uh, so you know about our background. Um, we are both security researchers and analy analysts. That means we are taking a look to a couple of um, technology. We are also doing pen tests and so on. And one area we, where we are active um, are telecommunication networks. And that is how we started to deal around with that protocols and all the technology here. Um, some, if somebody is interested about our research, I just want to mention our blog here, um, so there we, you will um, find a code, also some of the code we will um, show you here, we will publish there, um, so you can just go on that homepage and download it. Um, our motivation, why Volti? First of all, if we started with LTE networks in general, there are a lot of very, very interesting technologies behind. And that are all technologies nobody ever has taken a look to because most people think it's too complicated, maybe, or it's a different world. But it isn't. Especially for 4G networks, most is based on normal IP technology. That is what we want to demonstrate today. Um, the Vaulty stuff, for example, is just voice communication over an IP layer. So we will give you some introduction on how that will look like, an introduction to what is an IMS is. So IMS stands for IP Multimedia Subsystem. That are those systems and services at the operator, at the provider, which are serving you with that voice calls and also messaging services, later maybe also video service and so on. And We'll go a bit deeper into the technology so you understand why we are doing that stuff or how we are doing that stuff and giving you some yeah, uh, methodology and the kind of framework how you can attack those networks. Um, at the end, there will be a case study. Unfortunately, uh, we only have taken a look now to the German provider network because we are from Germany. Um, there are no uh, Switzerland implementations where we have yet taken a look to. Um, we dealt with a couple of networks in our job where we will give you some yeah, outlook, some knowledge transfer, what we've seen there, some experiences. Um, if somebody is interested to take a look to the Switzerland uh, network, maybe you can do that afterwards, just let us know. Okay. Um, starting with LTE in general. So to understand voice over LTE, here is the LTE network. So the so-called fourth generation mobile network, which is using LTE for the radio interface, uh, is looking like that. You have um, one antenna called e -Node B. You have a management entity, MME, that's just a server, which is all doing that control traffic stuff. Um, managing sessions um, and um, doing the authentication for you. So your mobile, called UE in the standards, um, is communicating first always with the MME, um, doing authentication, and then there will is an interface called S1 user plane, that's that one, which connects the antenna with a gateway also placed at the provider's edge, uh, which is routing all your traffic to a certain network. That certain network usually is the internet, um, uplink here, um, but also that could be some internal networks. Internal networks now, in our case, is the IMS. Uh, that is one network um, area in the provider's network which a couple of systems. Um, how is it currently with voice over LTE? Some providers have already implemented it, some providers are testing it, and uh, I think, and so in Germany uh, this year, all big providers launched um, Volti um, for some contracts, so you usually need to have a very big contract or a business contract um, if you want to have Volti enabled. And yeah, 
but some are still waiting because they are not aware of the technology, it's everything new and whatever, and GSM is working anyhow. But in the US, I think, um, there are some providers which are planning to shut down GSM networks, so they have to switch over to 4G and then also to Volti. So it's currently um, time for a change here, um, but it still needs some time, like we will see. Um, for those networks, you can just try it with your mobile phone if it's supported or not. You can just initiate a call and you will see if there, you are still connected um, to 4G network or not. Um, if not, uh, in some cases, uh, cases um, the phone is switching back to the old GSM network. That is called circuit switched fallback, CSFB. Um, that means the voice over LTE is not supported yet and you get a message a control message that you have to use the old, old voice services over GSM that you just see on your phone if you are calling. Um, if there is still the 4G symbol, then you have Vaulty. Okay, and that IMS is implementing that services. Let's taking, let take a closer look there how that is uh, um, yeah, set up. Here we have that part of the network. So if you are dialed into the LTE stuff or the provider's network, you have a subsystem here that is that area, but you are reusing the normal architecture. So here is our gateway stuff, so normal IP communication, like internet surfing and so on, and then you have an uplink to the internal network here, to the so-called proxy CSCF, call session control function. Um, there are three of that kind, a proxy, an interrogating one, and a serving one. The proxy is the first step in the network, then you have the interrogating one, which is dealing for first authentication and uh, searching for the responsible servers inside. And the serving one, uh, that one is all is doing all the further control traffic stuff and so on. So all services you request uh, will be handled by the SCSF usually. Um, what you also need is the HSS, the home subscriber system um, that is also available in normal 4G LTE networks, that's the database worthy user identity, and also the credentials are stored. So all the authentication material you need. Um, that is that one. And that is interconnected, at least with those both systems. Um, sometimes, always depends on the exact implementation and the product. So there are a lot of vendors uh, which are selling that one. Um, sometimes you also have interconnections to that MME or to other systems. In practice, you also have some interconnection to billing systems, um, so it's more complicated like here, but that's where we first want to focus on. That's the basic architecture. Um, but one more. Again, in practice, it's a bit more complicated. Um, you have a um, session border controller, an SBC in front of the PCSS. Even if that is just a proxy, you have a so-called SBC, which um, provides security functions. That can be part of the PCSCS, again, depends on the implementation. Um, and here, all the security stuff um, starts. So if you use IPsec or whatever, that can terminate here. But not only for your mobile phones, also other clients can connect here. Other clients means customer networks, um, big enterprise customers, uh, using voice over IP, um, or um, somebody might have heard from a, vo a voice over Wi-Fi. There was also some services like that. That are all using the same system, the IMS. And they are, um, the IP address, which is known, is the SBC usually. Um, we will take a closer look um, to that later. So how is that now implemented um, on a protocol base? There are mainly three, four protocols which are used to implement that services. The first one is SIP, so the session initiation protocol. That is used for all that control traffic stuff. So to do the registration, to initiate a call, to send a um, short message, that is where SIP is used. If you want to initiate a call, you also need this so-called session description protocol, there the media types, the codec and so on is exchanged. Um, also, the address of the um, application router. Application router means the, the, um, that point or that router where the voice traffic itself will be routed. That is exchanged via SDP. 
Um, then you have the RTP or similar protocol um, like that that is used to, used to transfer the voice data itself. Um, and sometimes you also have some XML embedded in the SIP, so in the body, um, or some XCAP, uh, to exchange further information. Further information means some stuff like um, yeah, availability message, uh, I'm here on my phone, I'm not on my phone, or some usernames, um, address books, that is exchanged via XML. Sounds good, right? Um, I think so an example that you understand it better, that is SIP. Uh, that is a typical um, SIP message, including SDP. So we have here SIP. It's, it's a clear text protocol, similar to HTTP. So we have some headers uh, and some content here. Then we have SDP, which is in the body, or can be in the body. That's optional, so it depends always on the message. In an invite, you need SDP here to describe the session you want to establish. Um, and then you have some interesting or some basic headers. Here you have a command, register, for example, is available to register with the IMS. You have invite to initiate a call. You have message to send a short message. And then you have some subscribe if you want to attach the network again, if you want to say if you are still here. You have notify requests. Um, to exchange some further information, like that availability messages. And um, you have from and to. Those are very interesting. Um, you always have a source and a destination. Especially for a call establishment, you need um, to define from where the call is coming and which user you want to call. So usually, it can be usernames if you are um, using a typical VoIP network, custom network, or that voice over Wi-Fi um, usernames can be used in the voice over LTE, so coming from the mobile phone. Um, you have uh, that MSDN number, so the typical mobile phone number will be placed here. And then you transport some further information, like that SDP. The um, SDP itself, like you see here, it's an originator, again, an IP address from where the, that RTP traffic should be established. And you have some validity timestamps. You have also some media type, what you want to use, which codec you want to use, uh, and some further attributes. Also, some security information will be placed here. Good. Um, one step more. But the general idea is here, again, like mentioned in the beginning, you have IP beyond. So behind all the technology, you have an IP. If you take a look at the whole delivery from the UE, so the smartphone, to the IMS, we have at least two nodes between it. The e -node B, that's the base station, the antenna, and that PDN gateway, Packet Data Network Gateway. Um, don't focus on that acronym. It's enough to understand what it is for. It's a gateway. Um, so that is forwarding our traffic to the IMS. Here we have the, yeah, the radio stuff and the LTE layer, so a lot of protocols here we don't want to focus. But encapsulated here, we have our a normal IP layer, a TCP UDP, and our VoIP stuff. VoIP stuff now means SIP or um, that RTP, for example. Um, can be used via TCP, but also via UDP. So. Um, the default implementation mostly is UDP, I think, but I've seen some implementations also using TCP. It's optional. Usually the, um, the IMS supports both. Okay, so we have that one. That is um, now sent to the eNodeB. The eNodeB is now forwarding it to the um, packet data network gateway via a tunnel. So between that one, there is a tunnel um, with that protocol called GTP, so GPS Tunneling Protocol. Um, again, nice acronyms, which is UDP-based and just forwarding everything. So it's a not, not in, an a encrypted tunnel. It's just forwarding all my traffic so that the user is not able to touch any IP address or any uh, system between that. That's the only reason for that. But still, everything I put here inside, I'm uh, talking uh, on the IP level here, will be encapsulated and transported. And here, again, there will be some 
whatever, usually also Ethernet, uh, some internal transport network can, can be everything here. So what the provider is using. But again, here it's a direct connection for my, IP, uh, for my IP layer. So I can talk directly with my UE with the IMS. That's the message behind, and that's with normal IP. There will be some IP addresses I can talk to. Good. Um, starting with some security. Um, the security in general is based on either IPsec or on TLS. Um, that is what the standards say. And that is also, uh, I think most implementations in real world use IPsec, but there are also some which are using a TLS. Um, that can be used for SIP, but can also be used for RTP. If you want to have um, encryption there for RTP, you can use SRTP, for example, which is just SSL wrapped. Um, that is used for confidentiality, but also as integrity um, protection mechanism. Um, and uh, another advantage is that if you use that, you have a key behind that, so only the people having that key are able to talk that. Um, so you all have also a kind of authentication here. That is um, the principle behind that. Why that is important uh, will follow. Um, the, let's take a look to the encryption itself, and that will give an outlook how the providers are using it. So there are mainly two standards which are defining um, the requirements for security. We have the 3GPP TS-133-203, uh, which say the possibility for IMS-specific confidentiality, confidentiality protection shall be provided. So the possibility, that means nothing. Um, there is no requirement to really use that encryption. So it's optional. Um, but the integrity protection shall be provided. Shall be provided um, um, in the language of 3GPP means that is requirement. So at least we integrity protection must be used, but no encryption must be used for the signal traffic. Um, let's take a look to the media protection. There is only in that um, specific specification a note that the support of the IMS um, the media confidentiality protection is mandatory. So again, the support is required, but the, um, yeah, the, use, it, the use is optional. Again, even here, there is no note for integrity protection. So you can, if you take a look to practice, not much will do anything with the RTP, but the most will do at least um, integrity protection for signaling. Good. Um, how is the authentication done? There is one mechanism, IMS I AKA. That is a key exchange. Um, so in mobiles, you have one, a shared key, a, a fixed key, which is on the SIM card, and on the um, database at the provider, you have all the same key. So, um, and that one is used to derive via a handshake um, a session key. That is what Brian will explain later. Um, and that is defined in that AKA, um, IMS AKA. Um, that will also be used to authenticate against the IMS itself. And should protect against impersonation, of course, and maybe also user blocking. So only one guy should be able to do something. And that only that guy with the um, valid uh, yeah, key material. That's the goal. Um, problem here again is it is not feasible to use it for every message because if you take a look to the um, control flow, there will be a lot of messages. So all the authentication will only take place for the register message. So for the first authentication against the IMS, if you start your mobile phone and it's dialing into the network, it will register at the IMS. So that's the only point where authentication takes place. Um, that one is uh, looks like that. So start up your phone, and that will happen. Um, your phone will send a register message to that proxy CSCF, and that register message will be forwarded to the ICSCF. And here is the uh, uh, calculation of that session key. So they will ask the HSS, please give me all the session key, and the session key will be sent to the um, serving CSCF uh, and to the um, ICSCF 
will be distributed to the SCSF, whoever um, needs it. Um, so, and all further messages, um, yeah, here's a handshake. Um, so the first register just initiates the authentication process. In the second register, um, there will be that uh, validation of that handshake. And then you have a session key at the end. Uh, again, we will take a look to practice later. And after that procedure, you can send an invite message, whatever, and that is not authenticated itself via that key. That is, will be encrypted via the confidentiality key, so there is a kind of authentication, um, or there is a kind of table of IP addresses which uh, are allowed. That table usually is used at the proxy CSF or SPC, and it, it knows which user is using which IP address. Sounds good for spoofing, right? Um, so if no encryption or integrity protection is used, there could be some spoofing attacks. You just have to know uh, the IP address, and for UDP it will work, so you have to know the IP address, and you have to you know the user. But the user is that number everybody knows in its phone book, so we have some um, possibilities here. Good. Let's start with some attacks. Okay, so basically, as usually, if you attack a system, you actually need to know what you want to go for. You know, um, there are certain assets that you want to reach, there is data that you want to extract, or um, some system where you want to inject something. So with um, cellular networks, usually the ma most important thing for the operator simply is money. So the operator wants to make sure you know that um, if you do a phone call, you are billed for it. If you transfer data over the network, he wants to make sure that he makes his money. So that's kind of from the operator view the most interesting part. And if you look at basic attacker modulation, you know um, the things that you can do are the same as in most communication systems that you've got. So you can always go in, try to find certain information disclosures, try to find out with what systems you're talking, you know, maybe even if you establish a phone call, some data from the, the party that you're calling might actually be transferred to you. So you might find out where um, your communication partner is at, or maybe what kind of system he's running. And the same, of course, for backend systems. Then you've got typical injection attacks, um, usually aimed against the backend systems. As Hendrik already said, there is certain integrity protection, but still that's something that we want to be able to do. Um, same for side channels, as said, fraud protection, transmitting data, DOS taking down systems, and basically spoofing impersonation, as in going in and maybe being able to start a phone call as, as somebody else. Now, um, yeah, concerning the spoofing impersonation, there actually even is um, a study from 3GPP, so they themselves actually had a look at the topic, which is, um, yeah, the TS33832, which might be an interesting read if you're interested in the topic. So, um, eavesdropping, of course, is always something that every attacker wants to do. You know, you've got a data stream somewhere, you want to find out what kind of information is transferred. The problem in this situation is you've got LTE, you've got the, the communication over the air. So basically, the, the data that actually goes through there, the voice data, the phone call, is protected on different layers. So you've got um, protection and encryption on the air interface, you've got further protection and encryption down on the phone calls. So eavesdropping in this situation, of course, is interesting, but it's one of the rather complex and rather improbable scenarios. When you go for spoofing and impersonation, as Henrik already said, you've got basic zip communication. So you've got a field which says from and a field that says to. So basically going in and just changing the from field actually might make a different phone number appear of, on the phone of the guy that you're actually calling, which is a valid attack. The fields are in here. And if input validation isn't properly done on the backend systems, then everything that you put into the request will actually reach the other side. Then you've got information disclosures. Um, one very interesting part that we've seen here is something like if somebody calls you, 
then often the, um, the IP address of the phone that he's calling you with, for example, is transmitted over the network. So that's yet again secret information of the caller, which the guy that is called actually shouldn't get. And then, of course, um, vendor names, version numbers, that's usually the same as if you do any kind of web application assessment or web server assessment. You start a phone call, you see what the server answers, and you might actually be able to find out what exact system, what vendor the operator is using, and even version information and patch levels. So if you actually want to attack an operator, you can actually extract quite a lot of information on your actual target system. And then, of course, the interesting part, the location data. Um, the whole thing is it is still a cellular network, and you've still got basic um, cellular network operators behind there. So you've still got cell IDs, you've got tracking area locations, and factors like that. So, um, of course, for an operator, it's easier to work with data and data formats that you already know. So if you want to know where a mobile phone is, why not simply add a cell ID into your request and pass it on like that? So simply, well, transmitting data that you're used to. Going for injection in text, um, we had it here. Changing something, uh, spoofing impersonation, or otherwise simply going in and really um, just adding data to your request the way you want it. As we've got stacks of, yeah, um, of XML, it's rather easy to just add extra tags and see what's going on. And I think it's actually on here. Um, if you've got an XML context where you've got something like an unknown param name, that does already give you a feeling on how the backend systems actually work. So you might be able to inject something. And here the interesting thing is that um, when working with backend systems, usually you have simple SQL statements that actually get processed. So if you go in and inject data into one of these requests, which is yet again in the Did I miss it? Yeah, ah, sorry, yeah. Um, like in here, this is an authorization request, or the register, and you've got the uh, authorization. You might actually be able to do plain SQL injection into a, a mobile or cellular operator's backend system, which yet again, as we said before, there should be integrity protection. We'll see later on how effective it is. But basically, you know, if you work with something like this, um, the backend systems are plain databases. They run basic operating systems. They speak normal protocols. So all the knowledge that you've got from your everyday network hacking, you can just apply to everything that's on the LTE network. So we can actually start in reusing tools. Then as I said, you've got um, XML-based injection. You might be able to pass stuff on to backend systems or to clients that you're talking to. Yet again, those are attacks that have been done with um, zip communication for quite a while. It's basic VoIP. Voice over LTE is VoIP, so we can simply transfer all the attacks that we know into the cellular dom domain and start attacking systems. Then the interesting thing, um, side channel and frauds. So um, you know what you usually want to do is if you've got your contract, say you've got a data limit, you want to be able to transmit data to somebody you know for free. So you need to find some way of actually transmitting data of the, over the network without the operator being able to account for it. And if you look at um, a contract that uses something like voice over LTE, the data that is used for the phone call doesn't get uh, reducted from your data volume that you've got. So these packets have to be tagged in some way. Um, the way it actually works on Android, if you um, go onto, an, onto a rooted Android phone and you do um, use the IP command to list all interfaces, you will find um, interfaces RMNet0 and RMNet1. If you don't have the voice over LT enabled, you should usually only find RMNet0 and with voice over LTE, you can find RMNet1. So 
doing a stupid guess, everything that goes over out of this different interface maybe might not be built. So what goes out? Basically all the zip communication. So it's XML, you can add data. So why not simply try to use XML or headers to actually extend the communication that you use? So you've got the invite. The invite request is basically um, the command or the packet that gets transmitted to the guy that you're calling that will make the phone ring. You know, the initial start, hey, I want to call somebody. And that this can work, usually this request is simply sent off to the back end and just copied down to the device that you want to call. Um, as such, if you add data and the back end system doesn't have any proper input validation, it will send everything to the other client that you put in. So instead of adding a, he um, a header with a little string in it, you can go in and actually try to enter complete files. You know, use something encoded base um, 64, transmit it, and you can be rather sure that it should be or should be received on the other side, depending on the backend systems. And this way, of course, you can cre uh, cause certain costs for an operator. You know, if instead of um, downloading your movie via your normal LTE connection, you transmit it via zip, just via the, um, the starting header, you know, that's for free. And then, of course, always a big problem, um, phone calls, basically being critical infrastructure, you've got DOS attacks. You've always got somebody who wants to be able to kill communication in some way. So, um, Normal approaches, you've got RTP communication, which transfers the actual voice data. If you're able to, um, well, throttle it, disturb it a little bit, then the voice won't come through properly. Um, you can go in and send certain requests, like the easiest, of course, is something like um, a goodbye or a cancel message. You know, if you can spoof an identity, you send the packet to the back end and you kill somebody else's call. Simple approach, if you're able to do it and the backend system doesn't properly validate the source of messages, it's a completely valid and very, very easy attack. And then you've got slightly different scenarios. So um, Henrik already showed you the, the register procedure, where basically you send in the register, um, a nonce is calculated in the back to be able to do the key exchange, so basically, um, a random value or rand value and an odd n value is used. And the question now is where exactly does this information come from? So the secret key, as Henrik said, is symmetric. So it's on your SIM card and it's somewhere in the back end. And this key is simply stored on the HSS, the home, subscri home subscription server. So um, basically, when you start to register, a session is open to the HSS, which is usually just a stupid database. Data is extracted, and the whole authentication process is started. And what we've seen in one implementation, um, actually the HSS went in, allocated memory for the data for this one single session for the authentication, for the key exchange, but wasn't able to do it for a second session at the same time. Basically meaning the database goes in, I've got, has one little field for one simple session establishment, and if you just go in with a register and just register again from time to time, you've actually got a DOS on the home um, subscription server in the end, resulting in a situation that nobody else on the network is able to send in a registration request. Um, funnily enough, as said, we've seen this in a, pl in a practical implementation, there are a few papers on a discussion between um, Siemens and Ericsson. When the IMS was implemented or was designed, there were two different approaches. Siemens said, let's go in and let's, um, let's have most of the authentication run against the PCSCF and use the SCF, SCSCF2. So kind of saying, um, extracting data from here and have the session somewhere on a different system, not on the database. 
Ericsson, on the other hand, said, um, let's go in, let's use the database and add some logic to it. So that the system that's been in cellular networks, VHSS, since the beginning of GSM, let's fiddle with that and extend it a little bit. So following the Siemens principle, this situation that we've had here with the DOS on the HSS shouldn't be possible. And that seems to be the way that most vendors have gone for and that kind of made its way into the implementations. Whereas in this specific case that we had, actually the vendors stuck to going for the other implementation and yeah, making the whole system open to DOS attacks. Then we'll switch over to a few case studies. Yeah, so um, let's take a look to our proactive work. So to show you something out of the real reality, we've bought two SIM cards, um, one from German Telekom and one from O2, so Telefonica. Um, so just some arbitrary network to show you some factors. Um, it, that will work with every, every network. Um, so what we need? A contract, usually, SIM card uh, supporting Volti. We need a rooted Android phone, and we need Android tools, so that Android debugging shell and so on. Um, a rooted Android phone uh, supporting Volte E is not easy, um, especially we searched a couple of times when the um, yeah, Volte was supported in Germany. Um, they first supported Samsung Galaxy S5, then they didn't support uh, one week after, something like that. So we had to search for new phones, then we had the S6, then it was also um, not supported anymore. At the moment, uh, we have an S7, uh, you see here, um, that is currently supported, so we did our test with that once again. Um, but you see the providers are still working on. The only thing which is um, supported on almost every provider is the iPhone, but that didn't help us with our tests. So root on iPhone is not that easy sometimes. Uh, we need an Android for our tests. And also at this day, or at that point, very interesting, if you actually have um, an operator that you're interested in, just simply go and Google for um, voice over LTE support. You've got it with the German operators, you will find something like three or five articles saying um, voice over LTE has been enrolled and activated. And these articles will appear in a distance of something like half a year meaning they started it, they killed it, they started it, they killed it, and they are still kind of in the middle of doing that. Yeah, and you will see why. Um, so for our first analysis, um, let's start, we can just go uh, and start our Android shell, um, take, take the command IP address, and then we have all the interfaces. You will see AMNet0, which is um, our data network in this case, and our AMNet1, which is the voice network. So it is an normal IP network, an IP interface with an IP address here, um, which is doing that VoIP stuff. So you'll see it's, you can just do your normal research here. Um, a first analysis can be simply done, just install a TCP dump on your system, um, start the ADB shell, start um, a TCP dump, you also can forward it to your laptop so you sh see it live in your Wireshark with some tricks, just using netcut and uh, yeah, pipe it to your Wireshark. That is easily possible. So ADB forward and then we see it live in Wireshark and can do some analysis. Who wants to do some more advanced testing, especially if it's encrypted, um, maybe for a TLS, uh, we need some, uh, some different setup for man in the middle, that stuff, but also very good to uh, read it a bit especially because it's a clear text protocol. We can use web application attack suits like Burp. Um, so you can pipe all the traffic via, uh, via um, um, TCP run uh, to Burp, and you see it in the proxy. You can work with the repeater, intruder, inject your stuff, and yeah, do whatever you want. Here's a short script for IP tables. You have to run that on your Android phone. Yes, there is an IP tables installed. Um, and then you are doing some nutting, forwarding it to your IP address, so that's the man in the middle IP address, uh, and from the verb you are sending uh, it back to the Android phone, and the Android phone is then injecting all the VoIP traffic um, um, which passed your PC to the RMNet1 again. 
So that's a very nice script you can use. Um, and the outcome is then something like that. In that case, um, that is now the telecom. So um, the German telecom, they are using now TLS. They are using IPsec. Um, same is 402. Let's take a look to the Wireshark itself. That's more interesting, I think. So here we go. What do you see? So we, if we prepared the talk, we talked about um, having a live demo here, but that's not that easy. First of the bad signal here in the building, and the second one, um, Volti is not supported by roaming, so um, not yet, or not from telecom in O2, I think. So here, that is our registering, so our initial login if we start our phone. Um, and then we are getting that unauthorized back. The unauthorized, let's take a look how that is looking like. We have here our authenticate uh, with a nonce value. So that is the one which is now sent to the SIM card, and then the session key is um, derived from it, which will be used for the IPsec stuff. The IPsec stuff immediately starts after that one. Here we have the ESP header. Um, there we don't see much, but if we take a closer look again, no. ah, here. We see there is plain text in. That means that is only integrity protected, no encryption here. Um, but badly readable in Wireshark, so we extracted that for you. It's looking like that. So here is our register again, and that's the second register with the response, so our MC, and yeah, our yeah, AKA version one MD5 um, mechanism behind. So what else can we see? A lot of interesting stuff. We see a lot of IP addresses here. We see uh, here a cell ID that's interesting. Uh, that's our cell ID we are sending to the network. And yeah, much more. Here is that XML stuff again. Um, and an interesting header, here is something from Ericsson. So probably telecom is using Ericsson. For O2, it is quite equal. Um, I now want to take a look to a second capture. That's now an incoming call. The incoming call has some other interesting stuff like the IP address. So if I'm called, the IP address of the caller is included. That is something I don't have to know, so it's interesting again. That is stuff what we, you will see. 402, it's quite equal. Where was my presentation? Great, it crashed. Let's open again. Um, for the O2, um, you have even a bit more because you have um, some stuff like the version number of the IMS which is used. So there is a header called, um, it is a user agent. There also Ericsson is used as IMS and also the, um, yeah, the version number itself is included. So let's start the presentation again. Here we go. Um, the result of our reading analysis is here. So no encryption, integrity protection is in place. Both have some information disclosure about the IMS, and the telecom has some information disclosure um, of the IP address of the caller. Interesting. And the return cell ID. For the cell ID, just some hints and some hints. Um, the cell ID is used by two systems: the lawful interception system and the billing system. Maybe depends always on the architecture. The lawful interception system means if so, the police wants to track you. So maybe you can just change that one here so they will search in the US and not in Switzerland. So now whatever happens here. Um, that can be correlated with the MME, of course. Maybe the provider is doing it, some, sometimes not. Good. Um, but that's only reading. 
Yes, so, um, you know, if you're in a, in a penetration test, you might be lucky that the company that you're working for will, uh, will disable certain security measures so that you can go in. You know, disable um, transport encryption so that you can actually read the packets, inject data, and see how the backend systems work. In certain situations, that doesn't work. And the other way around, of course, um, you need to be able to explain to an operator why it's important to also actually check the protocols that are encapsulated in encryption. Because, you know, the, the typical approach, we've got IPsec around it, so it's safe. And nobody will ever be able to get into the IPsec. So um, the question now is how will we actually be able to write data and to actually get into the communications? So very simple ch um, challenge. We've got IPsec. Um, it isn't encrypted. It's just used for integrity protection. So we've got the ESP packets, which basically um, have a different protocol header and have a footer underneath, which just um, includes a signature. So every time we try to inject something, we'll break the signature. So we need the key to actually be able to do that. Um, finding the keys is easy. We know the keys are on the SIM card. So what can we do? Um, you know, we know the keys have to be somewhere on the phone too, at least temporary. Um, but the SIM cards, well, might be easier. SIM cards are protected. But luckily, we've got a few very interesting tools. We've got so-called SIM tracers. Um, the SIM tracer, we've got one here connected to our magic iPhone uh, S7. Um, the SIM tracer is just um, a device that you put in between the SIM card and a mobile phone, and you see all the communication that goes through. So if you have a look at that, um, it was a little bit complicated putting it in because our adapter wasn't able to fit into the SIM card slot. So we had to take our two-day-old phone to pieces and, yeah, do a few modifications. And going from there on, you will find um, the APDU packets. So that's the basic smart card communication between the phone and the SIM card. Um, we selected this packet because it kind of came at the same time as the register. Simple approach see when the communication happens, and go in. Luckily, the TS-131100 actually tells us what the communication between the phone and the SIM card looks like. So we start decoding it. Um, we've got a, a command class. We've got an instruction. We've got parameters. And we've got a little bit of information on yeah, um, bytes that we've got in there. Going in, this is the same data as we saw before. We've got the class, um, we've got the length of the data fields, we've got the payload. Then jumping into the payload, we've got the rand value and an odd n. Going in, decoding that a little bit, and we've actually managed to find the request that goes from the phone to the SIM card. Comparing it to the, what we saw before, We've got the nonce, which is um, base 64 encoded, decoded, we found the random, we found the odd n. That was the easy part. What we want are the keys. So we go down to the next um, packet. It's the SIM card's response. We look in there. Yet again, the specs actually tell us what these responses look like. Going through there, we've got um, the, the byte that just says, hey, authentication worked out and we are able to extract the, um, the encryption key and the integrity key. So these basically are exactly those keys that are used in the IPsec communication. So fiddling around with that a little bit and extracting a little bit more data from the communication, we've got HMAC MD596. We are able to break the IPsec communication from our own phone and start injecting data into packets just the way we want. And as such, um, we are open to actually attacking all, all the backend systems that are involved in the IMS process. And I think you've got minus one minute <laughs> left. <laughs> yeah, so, and that is exactly the point where the, um, the provider stops to say, ah, we are using IPsec, so we are safe against all that injection attacks, right? Um, the 
Another interesting point is, so we mentioned that it's not only voice, um, voice over LTE, there is a second implementation, voice over Wi-Fi. I will do just very quick, quickly now, um, that is coming from that point, but it's exact the same technology behind. Um, it's also using IPsec or it's using TLS. We have taken a look to one app which is available in Germany, um, it's from O2, it's called Message and Call, um, it's also available in other countries, I don't know if, if here. Um, that one is not using IPsec, that is using TLS, but in a very, would say, bad way, because you just can exchange the certificate. It's your phone, it's your rooted phone, and they don't do a correct um, certificate pinning here, so we've been able to exchange our certificates um, and access the, cert and the clear text traffic again. Um, that is what I mean, or like the talk before, you have access to the APKs, you can reverse everything, you can change everything, so the provider will never be safe for such attacks. That I will now uh, skip due to time reasons, the guy's getting nervous here. <laughs> um, but yeah, you have access to the exact the same technology again. Um, what here was a bit strange, um, if we have taken a look, so we have encryption, but it doesn't help, integrity, TLS, no encryption, doesn't help. Authentication is done via MD5. And MD5, mm, what means that there is no AKA behind, that means there is a password in the app itself. Taking a closer look, we have seen that GET request. So they're in front of dialing in, it's doing an HTTP GET request to some external resource in O2 and downloading here its user password. That is also very, very crazy. I don't know why they use the SIM card, maybe they are not allowed to with the app, I don't know. But that is also an implementation failure, failure uh, where the providers must take action to. Um, let's come to a conclusion. What we have seen in all the implementations we've analyzed, they are differing very, very much. So it's all the vulnerabilities we've shown here, everything we have seen outside, but um, the one provider has completely different um, vulnerabilities than the other ones. But that's a good point, the providers are all working on it, they are fixing it, they are talking with the vendor, and they are doing quite a good job, um, usually, or in most times. Um, and that is the message of the talk, the, mobiles, the mobile itself will always be an untrusted device. There will be some guys which can use uh, or exchange the apps, exchange the certificates, or just access the, um, yeah, the en encryption material on the SIM card. So all the attacks will always be possible. The only thing a provider can do, or the vendor can do, is validate the input. Validate all requests, filter out information disclosures, um, only process the necessary header fields, and throw all, uh, away all unnecessary fields available there. So a good parser is needed. Good, um, so that is what we wanted to show you. Um, thank you for your time. If there are questions, I think you can come to us afterwards. Sure. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.